My name is David. I'm co-founder and CEO of SimScale. I've got a CFD background. Um, and what I want to do today with you is a quick session on how CFD in general and um, uh, SimScale in particular can be helpful in the design of ventilation systems um, in buildings. And um, now that the audio is working, um, an another quick technical note, you can ask questions. So at any point in time during the webinar where you have a question, just raise your hand or, um, or ask a question in there. And um, that way you, um, yeah, you can just follow the webinar. And if I have not enough time to answer all questions, um, I'll be sure to afterwards follow up by email. We're seeing a lot of interest in on SimSkill from the architecture and built environment um, world. There's lots of architects, lots of engineers concerned around how to make a building more energy efficient, how to um, reduce its CO2 emissions, generally how to um, um, how to yeah basically design buildings for the future, right? Because energy efficiency, sustainability becomes a topic um, that is very important to all sorts of products, in particularly in particular to buildings, as they are a major um, contributor to the global energy consumption, to the global um, uh, CO2 emissions. And um, as you can see here on the right, a little chart um, I found that shows that ventilation is a big portion of the energy consumption of, um, in that case, commercial buildings. But we've got other charts that also show that for, um, say, um, industrial buildings or also educational, these sorts of things. Um, and so what we want to do today is we want to look at, um, we want to do a little case study to see how CFD can be used to improve the ventilation system design of a particular building. The two different ventilation strategies that we're going to look at today um, are displacement ventilation and mixing ventilation. Um, and th as these pictures show um, that are from um, are for Price Industries, on the left we can see a little animation how the displacement ventilation system works. In this case you bring in the conditioned air most of the time in a cooling setting. You bring in the conditioned air at a very low height in the room. and you um, it's it spreads across the room because it's typically of lower temperature than the initial temperature of the room and then buoyancy or the buoyancy effect is used to ventilate this room right so this cold air um, comes in contact with a heat source in the room and that could be a a, a human that could be a computer that could be some other um, source of heat and there, a thermal plume is being generated, so the, the air heats up, um, and uh, thanks to buoyancy, it's being brought um, to the top, and up there, um, it leaves the room again. The, uh, the, the beauty of such an approach is that you actually only ventilate where you want to ventilate, right? And oftentimes in occupant spaces that are very high, what you do not want to do is all of the, um, the conditioned air where you put a lot of energy into either cool it down or yeah, most of the time to cool it down, to clean it, to filter it. You don't want to bring that in the entire room where there's no occupants, right? You want to bring it there where occupants are. Um, so that's sort of the, the idea behind the displacement ventilation. And on the right, another approach, the mixing ventilation, where um, the conditioned air is brought in from the top um, in, with higher velocities. And um, you want to ensure that the conditioned air is immediately mixed everywhere in the room um, and then leaves again uh, the room. So another another strategy. There's lots of pros and cons, right? And, and Honestly speaking, there is no one right ventilation uh, strategy for, for all situations. It just depends. It, it depends on the room. It depends on the requ requirements, right? We've got our customers being mainly concerned around, for example, noise, the noise level, right? At a displacement ventilation, you can bring it in um, at lower speeds so your fans don't have to do so much work, so the noise is generally lower sometimes. but sometimes the displacement ventilation strategy doesn't work too well in a, in a heating application, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a contaminant control or contaminant removal component to the discussion here. So there's no one right ventilation strategy. And what we want to do today is simply for one application, compare the different ventilation strategies with CFD and see how, the, how this looks. 
One example that uh, I found particularly fascinating is um, the San Francisco airport where there's lots of case studies and lots of uh, documentation and, and videos online where they showed the renovation of the Terminal 2. Um, it, it was fascinating for me to learn that all of this is done via displacement ventilation, so it's a very high occupant space. And since um, they only wanted to um, ventilate the parts where humans are, they chose a displacement strategy and um, yeah, there's, it works well with energy consumption, etc. So it's a, it's a rather recent ventilation strategy. Um, but it's being applied in more and more settings and there's more and more uh, component vendors that, um, that uh, supply components for that. All right, let's get our hands um, into CFD. What we want to look at today is a practical scenario, arguably a very um, schematic or an easy one, but it'll, it'll allow us to see all principles. It'll allow us to, um, you know, do easy post-processing, et cetera. And we've seen customers doing the same type of applications, um, the same type of analysis with much more complex CAD models. What we're looking at today is a is a partitioned room. So we've got two rooms, and we've got um, we are thinking of what type of it's typically that's kind of a boardroom setting or an office setting, right, where people do such simulations. And we're thinking about two a couple of things when 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 designing a ventilation system. First and foremost, okay, where to put our diffusers, right? That I have on the one hand. Um, uh, you know enough supply of fresh air, but I uh, by, but I don't risk draft risk, and I don't risk uh, thermal comfort problems. These sorts of things, right? What type of diffuser do I choose? Where do I put my returns, um, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So all of these things are are of concern. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go through different scenarios. So we're going to look at how would that room look like when we choose a um, displacement ventilation strategy, how would it look like with a mixing uh, strategy, and then we also change the diffuser outlets, uh, sorry, the, uh, the diffuser outlets and then the, um, the return location as well. The post-processing will look at particular region in this, in this domain. These cylinders are simplified humans, right, so they emit heat, um, it's a source of heat in this room, and we are interested in how the air conditions around these humans look like. So how, how fast is um, the air moving there? What temperature do it ha does it have? Because um, this will be ultimately important for determining the thermal comfort of um, the humans or the occupants in this room. Furthermore, how exactly we're going to simulate this is the following. We're going to look at um, a first simulation, sort of our baseline simulation, where we're going to do a displacement ventilation strategy. So you can see that um, we're, looking, we're looking at a summer scenario. So it's, um, it's hot outside, or we assume it's hot outside. And we bring in conditioned air at 19 degrees Celsius and at um, uh, three air changes per hour. So in all simulations we're going to run today, we're going to have the same volume flux of air being brought in. 3 ACH, um, air changes per hour. So we bring it in here in the lower left and the return location is always marked in red. It's up here, right, in the, in the top right. We simplify the boundary conditions by simply saying, you know what, it's hot outside, um, so we're going to assume the windows to bring in a certain amount of um, heat and the occupants as well. And we, the rest of the envelope of the room envelope, we simply treat as adiabatic. There's many different boundary conditions you could choose here. Um, you could also choose the occupants to be a volume heat source. You could choose the windows to actually have a, a wall um, heat flux boundary condition where you would give an external reference temperature and a heat transfer coefficient, etc. But just for the, um, for the simplification of the problem, we assume these boundary conditions. All right, we're going to do all of this today with SimScale. Um, just a few words about SimScale. Um, I know that some of the audience um, already know SimScale, already has an account. Some of you are new to SimScale, so uh, why another CFD software, right? Why did we choose to, you know, build a new one? Um, why we built SimScale is that we wanted to build a CFD software that is, uh, first and foremost, accessible, meaning there's no hardware no software on your end, uh, so zero footprint there. Um, it's simply a web application that you um, that you start in your web browser. From a pricing perspective, we wanted it to be um, 
that the cost scales with the value you're getting out of the solution. So you can start it actually entirely for free. There's a public free plan um, that allows for um, free simulations as long as you share them with the community. And then there's um, um, a tiered way into uh, the professional plans where you can choose your own computing power, your own um, uh, computing quota that you might need. Last but not least, the necessary know-how that used to be required for traditional desktop systems is something we all also wanted to see gone, right? So there's a, a couple of mechanisms we've built into SimScale to make it um, easier for engineers not being exposed to simulation on a daily basis to be effective with it. So for everyone means we've got uh, real-time support built into it so you can share every simulation project with colleagues or with the SimScale support. There's a chat functionality in there so you have um, you can collaborate much easier in the simulation project. There's a large community with many public projects that you can tap into and a bunch of more things. Um, so we want it really to be a tool that um, that is much more accessible than the, um, the traditional um, simulation tools. Quick look at the features. Um, today we're going to mainly focus on CFD, so you can see a bunch of those things here. So it's not just about convective flows and, and incompressible flows that are important to the AEC sector, but also you know multi-phase flows that you can see in the top right, or also rotating machinery. There's fully compressible flows, transient turbulent, these sorts of things. So um, a, a full stack CFD software. Um, and beyond that, it's not just a CVD software, but there's also a fully fledged FEA tool in there that you can see in the top right, um, and then also different heat transfer mechanisms and a couple of more physics that we support. And um, in the next two to three minutes, I want to give you just a, a quick feeling uh, how SimScale looks and feels um, when you use it. We do not have the time to um, go into the details. It's, it's not supposed to be a detailed tutorial today, rather a quick glance at how CFD looks like on SimScale. So we're going to do that today. It's a web browser. You can see that, right? So you bring it in. You bring in your CAT model. You upload it to SimScale. You can then interact with it in 3D. You switch to the, um, to the mesh generation, you generate a computational grid, you set up the physics, run it in the cloud, and then do post-processing also online. Let's take a look how this looks like. All right, so let me log out here real quick. So this is simscale.com, and if you do not have an account, it takes two minutes uh, to create one for you. After you've done that, you can just log in, such as you're used to on a, um, with your email client or um, you know another web tool. Um, and and there's a bunch of projects I'm working on, and I'm opening up the project that I want to show in this webinar. This is now the full UI of SimScale, right? So you have 3D interaction in here. You can interact with the 3D models. Let's hide this. And that's just something we looked at, right? We've got these two rooms. We've got these potential inlets and outlets uh, where we're going to simulate different scenarios. We've got the human heat sources here in the middle. Um, Etc. And the typical workflow on SimScale is then you, the first thing you typically do is you generate a mesh. For CFD, SimScale leverages um, a finite volume solver. Um, so this is a finite volume mesh, and so you can see that we uh, generated um, a grid. There's lots of automation in mesh generation, but you have also full control if you want to, you know, control details of this. The philosophy is always that you should be able to dig into the details of a solver or of a mesher, but you should not be forced to, to do that. Um, that was the mesh, and then in the simulation designer, you actually define the physics. Um, let me quickly just give you a brief idea of, of how this looks like. Let me turn off the surfaces here and um, Uh, let's hide those again. And so in the simulation designer, you define physics. The first thing is you define where is air, right? So in the entire domain, I have air, and I defined its properties here. Um, the next important thing is, okay, what about my boundary conditions? So the first important one is my velocity inlet. So what I'm saying here is that at um, this is 19 degrees, right, to 292 
Kelvin or 90 degrees Celsius, at 19 degrees Celsius, conditioned air is entering at 0.27 meters per second in positive x direction, right? Looking at the, at the coordinate system here. So I'm bringing in the fresh air here. Pressure outlet, we've got over there, right? So we're simply saying, okay, gauge pressure is zero, so this is just surrounding pressure. Um, and then there's actually not a lot to say, so the next thing is we've got our humans um, at a certain heat flux per area, and we've got our windows at a certain um, heat flux per area. Um, and a last notable item is here. Bef when, I, when I'm ready with my physics and I now want to run the simulation, um, the beauty of the cloud is that you have computing capacity um, as you want it, right? So you can just choose and how many cores do you want this simulation to be carried out. In that case, I choose, chose a 32-core machine, um, something, you know, that, that's pretty decent and not a lot of people just have sitting under the desk. Um, and I could just run 10 of these simulations in parallel because everything runs cloud-based. Um, and so once this simulation, I mean, I, I obviously carried this simulation already out um, and uh, computed it. It took roughly, I think, a little bit north of 100 minutes, so a little bit less than, um, than two hours on these 32 cores. And then what I'm able to is I'm able to directly online visualize my results, right? What we're looking at here is um, the velocity field in a, in a cut section through the room. Right, so we've got in red we're talking 0.27 meters per second. Let me rescale that a bit. Yeah, 0.2 meters per second in a cross section, right? And I could now also s switch this over to let's say temperature. I'm interested in the temperature distribution here as well. Um, also, let me rescale that a bit. Um, And then say 3, 10, or 13, and we've got. All right, and here I can already see, right, the different temperatures, so the, the stratification of the temperature here, the different layers that I'm, that I'm seeing, and then how hot it gets in the room. We're going to dig into that in a second in more detail. Um, but this is really a, like the, the full workflow, right, it, that I just showed you over there in the slides. Um, you bring it in, you bring in your CAT model, um, we're compatible with multiple CAD systems from, you know, SOLIDWORKS, Rhino, um, Autodesk Inventor, et cetera. Um, and then you generate the mesh, set up the physics, run the simulation in the cloud, and then be able to post process online. All right. Um, and now what we want to do is sort of just like in the next five minutes, now that we can't, now that we're able to run such simulations, what are we going to do with it, right? How how does that help in ventilation system design? And this is now just digging a bit further into understanding how this initial displacement ventilation set up, um, what type of temperatures it would generate, what types of velocities it would generate in the in there. And so here you can see a cut section at 10 centimeters room height, so at ankle height. Um, and then on the right, the same plot just from the top, right? And now we can already see how this works, right? So we bring in the conditioned air here from the left. Um, this is why it's cold over here. Um, and then the conditioned air distributed through the room, um, we bring it in at low velocity. That's important. And so it, it goes over here, but it's not as effective. So over here, we don't have a lot of um, conditioned air, right? And that's what we would expect, uh, right, from... from from in intuition, so we're bringing it over here. Um, oh, sorry for that. And the same, now that's a, a visualization of the velocity, and the red part is 0.2 meters per second. So you can see the low velocity we bring it in, and then we can see that uh, it loses the velocity as it travels over the ground of this room, and there's not a lot of velocity going on over there. But we've got a decent spread of this, right, of, um, of this conditioned air. And then now, looking how this air rises, is we can see the thermal plumes here um, around the cylinders that, that represent our humans, and um, seeing seeing this rise, right? And what I what I found interesting is that 
the um, on the right you can see a temperature uh, distribution of this and so we're bringing in cold air actually on the left right so I would expect that I, my initial intuition would have said okay that we've um, that the the left room is probably going to be colder but due to the fact that this is a steady state simulation right so it looks at the at the steady state result of this sim uh, of, of, of the scenario um, we do have the outlet in the right room, right? So hot air is being able to, um, or is able to aggregate or yeah, in the left room without, you know, going over to the right room, right? So at steady state, the left room, even though we're bringing in the cold air there, is hotter than the right one. Um, also in average, we're going to see that later in a, in a quantitative plot. Um, but other than that, right, that's what we would expect. So the rising temperatures to the top, um, and quite a difference. We're, we're later looking at deviations in, in the room. I mean, there's quite a difference. So at the bottom, we've got 19 degrees Celsius, right? At the top, it's very hot. Um, here's another one, again, um, showing what we would expect. At the window, we can see air rising again. We have a buoyancy effect there as well. We can see here at the outlet that um, the, the yeah, that air is moving fast out of the outlet, and then over here, the temperature plot. And having that understood, a next step that the customers then typically do is looking at, okay, different strategies here. And what we want to compare is two things. Um, at the top, we see three different versions of the displacement ventilation design. So this means you can see that, let me quickly get the drawings here. Um, in the first scenario, what we just looked at, we're bringing in the conditioned air from the left, right? And the right, we're bringing it from the right. And then in the, um, in the D3 scenario, uh, we're bringing it in from both sides. All of these scenarios do not differ in terms of what energy I'll put into the system. Because in all three scenarios, we're bringing in three air changes per hour at 90 degrees Celsius. So the chiller has the same work to do um, the energy invested into this ventilation strategy is the same, uh, no difference there, with, but obviously on the right, because we're bringing it in at two inlets, um, we are, uh, it, it's going to be at lower velocity to keep the, the volume flux the same. Now at the bottom, we'll compare that with three different mixing ventilation designs. Um, so M1 means we're not bringing in the conditioned air at the bottom, but at the top right, of the room to have a real mixing happening, and at higher velocities. You can see that the outlet is smaller than, than at the displacement ventilation design. At M2, we're bringing it from the right, again from the top, and at faster velocities. At M3, we're bringing it in from both sides, um, also with higher velocities. Important note here is that in mixing ventilation designs, you need to condition the entire room, right? Or you, you need to bring uh, fresh air and it ha have it immediately mixed in the entire room. So generally, to get to lower temperatures or to the same temperatures, you need to condition the air or you need to chill it more. So the chiller needs to put in more energy. We're bringing in the same volume flux, but at a lower, uh, at a lower temperature. So the mixing ventilation design will consume more energy um, in, in this little study that we're doing here. All right. Over the next few slides, um, it's going to be another few minutes in this uh, session. Over the next few slides, we're now going to compare these different uh, scenarios. On the left, we see the three displacement ventilation systems, right? Keep in mind, at the top, we're bringing in air from the left, middle from the right, at the bottom from both sides. What we see immediately is that um, the, the, since the outlet is on the right side, um, we can see that the... Um, the temperature differences between the two rooms is definitely the lowest um, at the in the middle scenario where we're bringing it from the right, which is interesting, um, and which for, was for me counterintuitive. On the right now, and but ultimately, I mean, it, it doesn't look too different, right? The the three di uh, different displacement ventilation designs, at least not in this plot. We're going to see a later comparison that there is quite a difference in terms of draft risk. On the right, we can see the three different mixing ventilation designs. Um, again, at the top, we're bringing it in from the left. Right. Uh, let me quickly grab the pen. So we're bringing it in from here. So you can see that's the temperature plot. So right at very low temperature, we're bringing it in due to uh, the, the lower density. It immediately goes down, right? That's what we expect. Middle scenario, same thing from the right. And then bottom scenario from both sides, like that, right? Um, What's, I think, already obvious is that the mixing ventilation 
design, it's the same temperature uh, scale, right? The mixing ventilation overall um, has a lower peak temperature, right? So we don't see a lot of red on the right one. Um, and it has a lower, a higher, um, lower temperature, as in the mixing is simply better, right? So we have much more mixing. We have a, um, a not so low velocity, uh, not so low temperature that we brought in. Um, let me move on here. Um, same with the velocity, right? So you can see already immediately it gets clear that on the right we're working with higher velocities. Um, again, because we want the entire room to mix, right? We do not just want to rely on buoyancy effects um, to to change um, velocity in the room. Um, yeah, and again, I have something we would expect, right? Um, and now, digging a bit into the averages and, and uh, averaging over all of these values, this is now a, a bar chart of, on the left you can see the average temperature, on the right we can see the deviation across the room in terms of, te in terms of temperature, right? Um, a is the left room, let's quickly go back, A is always the left room, B is always the right room, right? So that's D1, uh, A, D1, B, etc. right? So on the left we can see, let me quickly again use the drawer, um, so this is ventilation, uh, this is uh, displacement ventilation, this is mixing, uh, mixing ventilation. Interestingly enough is that the average temperature is not too different, right? I mean, obviously there's still quite a bit. I mean, here we've got an average of 17, right? 17, 18, something like that. Here we've got an average north of 20, but overall um, it's not too different. Where the difference gets quite obvious is um, the deviation in the room, right? And we already saw that in the in the um, in the previous post processing that between um, that the displacement ventilation comes with significant deviations in temperature across the room, and um, the mixing ventilation by definition has a lower one. Right? Again, depends on the application, depends on your design scenario, whether or not you can accept that or not. And now the last one, and I think that's a, a, a quite um, quite important view here. This is at three different heights across the room. Um, the, comparing the velocity um, in um, so in red you can see everything that's red is at 0.2 meters per second or higher everything at blue is basically not moving right and um, so and we can see again the the six different scenarios right so we have the three uh, displacement ventilation system we've got the three mixing ventilation systems and we've got um, now the three heights. So this is at 1.8 meters height, this is at 1.1 meters height, and this is at uh, 0.1 uh, meters height. Um, and now what gets very obvious, right, is that um, on the right we can see that all mixing ventilation systems have significant velocities overall, right? There's lots of red. We're particularly interested in the region around the, the occupants, but generally, right, the um, there's lots of red going on. M3 looks like that at least in the in the space A, so this one here, right? There's like not a lot of um, risk for um, that people feel uncomfortable because the velocities are too high. But on the right, we've got quite some regions, right? Um, yeah, and I mean all of that uh, in the context of that. There's depending on the regulatory requirements or depending on the the country. There's different values um, regulatory institutions give for um, peak velocities that you should not surpass to ensure thermal comfort. But um, one of them is uh, 0.2 meters per second, right? This is why we chose this value as a red one. So everything that's red, there might be um, people feeling uncomfortable, right? On the left now, the displacement ventilation scenarios. So we've got much like a much more homogeneous flow field, less um, less peak velocities. I mean, at the ankle height, because we're bringing it in at the bottom, right, there's also, I mean, decent uh, velocity. So there's definitely something going on. But particularly D3, the one where we brought it in from left and right, um, we've almost got nothing red, right? All of that now in the context of a, um, of a an application where we know that the that the energy being consumed by the mixing ventilation system is much higher 
than the energy consumed by the displacement ventilation system. So if I'm fine with the temperature variances or changes that the displacement ventilation comes with, and um, I'm fine with the, you know, that, that in heating the situation might look different, I could end up, depending on the scenario, saying that my D3 design is the one that um, that's probably the way to go here. That's sort of how you can, could interpret these results. All right, let me pause here for a second um, and quickly check on if we have an um, if we have any important questions because there's quite some questions that already popped up. Um, give me one second to go through. Um, so one registrant asks, how about so how to define the time required to reach a, a specified average temperature? What we've very good question. What we've done here is a steady state simulation. So this means we're only simulating the the equilibrium state of the system. So it doesn't tell us how long it takes until we're at this point. However, what you what we could have also done is run a transient simulation of this. This would mean that we're actually looking at you know how the air moves every second through the room, and we could um, then define how much time it takes um, to reach a certain um, temperature in the room. So that's certainly um, possible. It's more, it's, it's computationally more um, expensive, so there's more core hours uh, that you would need to invest there, but um, it's, it's possible. Okay, I'll move on at this point just to, to, to wrap up, um, because the other questions seem to be rather, um, I, I can take care of them later. To quickly summarize what we've done, right, and to get a feeling for um, what was necessary to run this project on SimScale, is that um, the the setup of this simulation is rather straightforward. You've seen it, right? Um, the geometry is not hard to be meshed. The simulation setup is rather straightforward. Um, so the the manual time to be invested is is not very very high. So in that case, a couple of hours. Since we can run all of this in parallel. Um, and one simulation roughly takes two hours, um, a rough estimate would be four hours uh, computing time, right? Computing time, since all of this can run in parallel. Um, it was six simulations, right? And then each simulation took around, I think it was uh, like roughly 60, um, yeah, roughly 60 core hours that one simulation took. And so overall, we're roughly at 350 core hours to run all of these simulations. Um, computing time, right? So that's, that's work the computer does. Um, all right, and then what we get as a return is we immediately see, like even at an early design stage, right, where there's just a conceptual idea of the building, we can immediately iterate on what might be a good ventilation strategy very early in the process. Um, the and, and here, just like a, a very rough um, comparison, right, we can see at the top the mixing ventilation design where we've got lots of draft risk, where we've got lots of velocities, and we invested more energy, right? And with a little bit of simulation work and a little bit of, um, you know, few hours invested, we come to a design that uses less energy, that um, has a has a lower, a much lower draft risk, um, a higher chance of um, ensuring thermal comfort for the occupants in there, and um, ultimately might be the better choice in that scenario. Again, this was a case study, right? There might be some applications where where the uh, mixing um, ventilation design would be better, there might be applications where this holds true. So I didn't want to say that displacement is the is the way to go. It was rather a general a general walkthrough. All right, with that, I'm ending um, the official part of it. Again, I'm. Um, I hope the um, this little session, this crisp session, could give you a feeling for how CFD is being used in ventilation system design. Um, the beauty of all of this is that you can just test it yourself. So you can just go to simscale.com, create an account in a few minutes, and um, you're off to start your own project. Um, there's a free professional trial. There's also a free public community account where you can do public work to learn. So um, I hope to see you um, soon uh, on there. I'll remain for one or two more minutes just to look into if there's a, another question I could answer. Um, but um, I want to end the, the official part of the webinar. webinar. Um, one registrant asks if um, the three uh, the three air change um, air changes per hour at 90 degrees Celsius and 16 degrees Celsius differs in power consumption. Um, yes, definitely. Yeah, um, I said it. At, I think I, I hope I said it at some point in the in the beginning of the webinar. Um, 
Yes, so we do know um, that the mixing system, mixing ventilation system that we signed up, um, and that we um, that we designed here, would consume more energy, right? But we also know that we need to bring it in um, uh, to to reach same average temperatures. We needed to do that because we're going to cool the entire room, right, and not just a portion of it. All right. Um, does this CAT model? One user asks oh, if whether or not this CAT model is available for us to test for our own. Yes, let me quickly show you that. Uh, what you can do is um, at simscale.com. There's a an icon here, or there's one one um, menu item here at the top that says public projects, and on here is, are lots of public projects um, that can be used as um, as a template for your tests. And if you search for ventilation, if we're lucky, you're going to find it. Otherwise, you're going to send it around. So there's many different ventilation um, projects on here. Ah, oh, yeah, there you go. Um, here's the project where uh, this simulation has been carried out, right? So you can simply go on there and um, hit the View button, and you can then see the entire project. So it's available available on there. Um, yeah, and another user also just asked it. So I'll what I can do is I'll send this project around um, that you that you can find and don't have to search for it. Um, yeah, all of this is publicly available, and um, you can dig down into the simulation setup. So that's um, that's by design and um, not a problem. Okay, well let's do one last question, and then um, I think I'll wrap, let's wrap this up here. Um, does SimScale provide fluid phase change capabilities? Um, we're ending now on a negative note, but <laughs> it's. Um, uh, that's fine. And no. So what SimScale provides is uh, is multi-phase flow analysis. So this means you can simulate two different fluids um, of different phases at the same time. You know, for example, in um, uh, to simulate uh, the water flow around ships, right, and the free surface that uh, that is being created between air and water. But what you can't simulate is how water, for example, you know, changes its um, changes to or condenses, etc. So there's no way that a, a phase can change um, over time during the simulation. Not yet. Let me put it that way. Not yet. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, again, thank you very much for um, joining the session today. I hope um, you. Um, got a better idea of how this uh, can be helpful for ventilation system design and I hope to see you soon on the SimScale platform. Take care and goodbye.